Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for another of our interviews. As part of our IPA in conversation with interview series, where we are looking at the impact of the COVID pandemic on publishers around the world. I invite you to go to our website to see other interviews and uh, find out who we will be talking to next. Today, it's a real honor for me to be joined from Washington, DC by the president and chief executive of the Association of American Publishers, Maria Palante. Maria, thank you so much for joining us. You'll go, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. So if it's okay with you, let's uh, start with some uh, questions uh, to have an, uh, a nice conversation. Uh, Maria, as, as president and CEO of AAP, you oversee a very important publisher membership. Before we talk specifically about current crisis, could you tell me more about your work? What is the predominant focus of the AAP team? Sure, uh, thank you, Hugo. I, and before I do that, I, I just wanna say thank you to you for your incredible leadership at the helm of IPA. Uh, you could not have predicted the, um, the situation that was handed to you, but uh, I'm a big believer that leadership finds people and, uh, and that the leader makes the moment. And so um, thank you for everything you've done to keep us all connected around the world. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Maria. It's a pleasure. Uh, so at AAP, um, we have a really vibrant publishing market and it, it's a real privilege to represent the industry on matters of law and policy. Uh, at, our, at our core, we believe that uh, a robust, innovative, and financially secure publishing industry is vital to the public interest, really to democracy. And in our day-to-day -day work, that translates into lots of strategies. So we work, um, again, at a high level to, to achieve outcomes in regulatory policies, legislation, and in the courts that incentivize publication, but particularly a wide variety of creative expression and professional and scholarly content and learning solutions. One wonderful thing about our global publishing industry is that it's been endlessly innovative and has this deep, deep legacy uh, that goes back and in, in our nation, literally to the dawn of our constitution, our democracy, uh, but is also so forward thinking and always adapting. And uh, it's, it, it, it it's nice to, to realize that um, one thing that people have had in common for, for centuries is the love of language and books and expression and education. Absolutely, thank you. Th thank you, I fully agree with you about mm -hmm. the uh, um, um, innovative uh, 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 spirit of publishers that we're constantly trying to see where we can innovate. Uh, I think it's a great job you do in, in AAP, not only uh, in the U.S., but also with uh, all the international cooperation. I mean, uh, the AP is really uh, such an active member of, of, of IPA. Thank you for that as well. Well, thank you, Hugo. It's a global world that we're, we're all connected at, and, uh, and we have a shared mission. And so I, I do believe that uh, we in the association world, uh, in achieving our objectives, uh, are also uh, sharing the shared objective globally. So what you do affects us and what we do affects you. And um, under the umbrella of the IPA, the International Publishers Association that you're leading, we all get to see each other every now and again, if only virtually. If only virtually, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and now that you mentioned, and, and, and yeah, indeed, we're uh, really globalized and I think it, it, it won't change uh, uh, that part of globalization and, and, and what, uh, happens in one country and internationally will, will affect other countries as well as we are seeing with the with the pandemic I mean the the pandemic is really affecting us all around the world it seems now to be shifting from Europe across to the Americas uh, the World Health Organization reports as of this morning very close to two million cases in the US could you tell us more about the situation in the US are you still in lockdown are or where bookstores closed and did all employees in publishing houses have to work from home or how, how are things uh, moving along in the yeah, US? Yeah, thank you, Hugo. And, um, and, and you know, my best wishes to you and your family and your company uh, and, 
Thank and you. you know the beautiful country of Mexico as well. It's it, it truly is a worldwide crisis. In the U.S., um, it, in mid March, things began to go from uh, speculative to crisis fairly fast. And for the publishing industry, that translated into um, I would say, you know, a week or so of um, enhanced telework and uh, liberal leave policies for people that might be ill or have family members that were ill to almost suddenly forced uh, mandatory telework just to protect employees from having to take subways or you know undo commutes or to or when schools were closing to not be there for their families uh, on the plus side i would say that that transition um, while not seamless, was fairly effective, uh, meaning that we are uh, in an industry that is able to telework and still uh, acquire and produce, you know, edit and uh, sell books. But, um, you know, there's also a physical component to it. And so one mm -hmm. of the things that AAP worked tirelessly on at the very beginning in March and April was... Uh, you know, we, both federal legislation and state legislation or state executive orders. So at the federal level, there were immediate stimulus packages in the U.S. as there were in other nations. And one of the questions was, you know, what could AAB, AAP do to help its partners, for example, in the education space? And so we were very active. My colleague Kelly Denson did quite a lot of work to lead coalitions to make sure that education was prioritized because the education system is really important to publishers. And as you know, so much classroom learning immediately shifted to online, where it had been online in parts before um, it, it became online immediately. And then, you know, the question became, what degree of training is necessary? Where are the funds needed? Um, uh -huh. If the content is available, uh, what else do you need to make that content really work for the students? And that was both in the pre-K-12 space and I think to, in the higher ed space as well, although our higher ed publishers have long been out front in the online marketplace and I think uh, we're ready to go and really step in and help lead. So there was the stimulus um, you know, uh, activity at the federal level and in the states, we had 50 different state executive orders or pending orders to work through. Those were important because they were all about the degree of lockdown state by state mm -hmm. and, and the degree by, of which uh, there was accepted activity. And so we really uh, worked hard to communicate the essential parts of the publishing industry uh, to the governors and to the members of Congress in those districts. They were all extraordinarily helpful policymakers, uh, and really did believe that publishing was essential. You know, during mm -hmm. a crisis, you don't want to shut down access to information or books, and uh, even with online commerce, as we'll talk about, I think in a minute, a, a huge portion of online commerce is still print books. And so we had warehouses uh, that were open. We had to balance that with. Um, uh, our publishers really making sure that their employees were safe, those that had to be on the ground uh, supplying trucks with books and feeding bookstores and consumers. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a lot of activity and I'm really proud of the work that our staff did. Uh, I have a small but really uh, talented staff and on that particular issue, Matt Barblon, who's our VP of Public Policy, just did an uh -huh. outsized uh, amount of work. Um, that's that's uh, interesting to know, and and, and especially that that you did have mm -hmm. some uh, stimulus packages. Uh, uh, I know some countries uh, have had such uh, stimulus, and 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 unfortunately, not all countries. IPA has been working with try with our local associations, national associations, to try to get those uh, uh, packages from governments. Uh, for example, here here in in, in Mexico, unfortunately. We, we haven't had any uh, help whatsoever from from the government, so so oh. we we have had to face the situation by ourselves. And, and by the way, that. yeah, Please. sorry. Uh, just uh, would add that um, at AAP we have a, a vast range of members. So we have some of the largest publishers in the world, and then we have some of the smallest as well, regional specialized publishers. And for some of our smallest publishers, uh, just just being able to 
pay their employees uh, and keep their business going became the priority. And uh, we had something, thankfully, at the federal level called the Paycheck Protection mm -hmm. Program. And so we were also able to help facilitate um, you know, the qualified access to that program for some of our smallest members, uh, because you want them to be able to bounce back when this is over. Exactly, exactly. And by the way, I also wanted to, I hope that, that you and your family are also doing, doing fine. Thank you for, for asking for, for, Thank you, Hugo. for me and my family. I hope you're, you're doing well uh, as well. You're and well. I, I think you uh, already kind of um, mentioned uh, things that are uh, coming in two further questions, but let me uh, uh, take the first one. Uh, you also already started to mention that it has a, a, a very important it still has our, our, our business, a very important physical component. Uh, what do you think was a rough split of physical sales uh, against uh, digital sales before the lockdown? And if that has uh, changed and, and do, do you see that change continuing or growing in the future? That's a, such a, it's such an interesting question. So uh, generally print is still king in the U S market and you know, some 74, 75% of book sales last year were print copies. Uh, now, some of those are bought, you know, um, at bookstores, some of them are bought by libraries, and some of them are bought through e-commerce platforms and shipped, you know, so there's an online, again, the, the physical part of the online chain. Uh -huh. uh, but, um, you know, the question becomes, at what point can we sort of get statistics that show us what's happening? From January through April, print was still fairly strong. Uh, we had rather than 74.74%, of our sales in the consumer uh -huh. market were print. Mm -hmm. The downside of that is that the biggest bump and the decline was in April. So in April, we took an 11, nearly 11% hit in print sales. Mm -hmm. That's not surprising to me for a couple of reasons. Um, April was the most disruptive month at all, uh, of all, right? People were still transitioning. Uh, peop, you know, bookstores and libraries were not sure if they could stay open or not and under what circumstances. Mm -hmm. Educational institutions uh, were, not, you know, were not there anymore on their campuses or for their bookstores, et cetera. And so the prince, and people also began to perhaps look at digital models while they were home. And I think that's the exciting part of this. I, still think that um, given the long, strong history of print in the last few years, that that will be fine. Uh, it shows a propensity for print that's, that's got staying power. At the same time, and I think this is what you're alluding to, the question is, have people experimented with digital formats for the first time while they're, while they're sheltering in place? And that also seems to be true. Uh, there was an increase in eBooks which is interesting because ebooks had been declining slowly for a while. Audiobooks have been increasing every year since 2012, um, month by month, and they took a, a you know a nice bump up as well. So, you know, to me, this all shows sort of the um, importance of storytelling that publishers, uh, you know, it's really our mission, right, uh, to connect Absolutely. authors with readers. And I think it shows the importance of storytelling, though, during a crisis in particular, people were turning to all kinds of books about all kinds of topics, and they were listening to books uh, together with whomever they were sheltering in place with, which is really, a, I think, just a, a natural human instinct, sort of to be together and, and experience a story together. And um, I, I think for years to come, we will all be looking back at this period and remembering what we read and what we heard and who we were with. I mean, what we were thinking, so absolutely. Uh, I, I, I think I, we're in a good place. Yeah, absolutely, and I fully agree with you on the importance of, of storytelling as part of what we do, and I think it's interesting that I, I, I can see that in, in many other countries, I think it's still very similar, that, that print is uh, still king, and, and it's also interesting that though people, I think, have uh, 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 become more comfortable, perhaps, with uh, reading uh, digital uh, books. On the other hand, 
it's also interesting to see that people uh, continued buying online physical books and that booksellers, I was talking to, to, to booksellers and, 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 and what they had to do to deliver the books. They went out on, bi on their bicycles and on skateboards and whatever wow. to, mm -hmm. to deliver the books to, to their customers. It was, it was awesome. Yeah, it's terrific. And that's the consumer market that I was describing uh, and, and mm -hmm. obviously a really important market. But I, I do want to just uh, say again that for our educational publishers, they've been part of the online uh, world for a while. And I really am proud of them as well. They, they not only uh, were ready to go with digital content and all mm -hmm. kinds of business models, right, from subscriptions to inclusive access to open access models, um, you know, a spectrum of, of exciting models for, for all kinds of students of all ages. But they, um, you know, they, they were just really wonderful, generous citizens. They provided free access. They took calls from, you know, students and educators who maybe needed to be become comfortable. Uh, and so, you know, again, the education publishers, I think, are really poised to help lead this next era. And in our professional and scholarly world, and I know this is true globally, our publishers provided almost immediate uh, free access to journal content that might pertain to a vaccine. So anything that might reasonably pert pertain to a vaccine for COVID-19 uh, to make it available for free immediately uh, to scientists, to doctors, and honestly to the general public. And so I just really um, love that about our industry, just the honor of the industry. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and you just you just answered my next question. I was oh. going to ask you about mm -hmm. that. Um, but really, I, I, I think um, I, I've heard of some really amazing things publishers have done uh, in the US and in, in, in other countries to, to support their communities uh, in these times. And uh, I think it, it makes me personally feel proud to be a publisher. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. I agree. So, uh, and on another on another topic, uh, and, and 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 you mentioned policy is is a, is a great part of, of your work, and and I suppose it mainly has to do with with copyright, which is of course something of special interest to publishers all around the world, and and for IPA of course. And this crisis has also been used by some groups to advance their own agendas to to weaken copyright. I know you recently filed an important lawsuit in one of these cases. Could you tell us more about this? I, I, I'd be happy to. Uh, on June 1st, uh, four of our member companies, Hachette, HarperCollins, Penguin Win Random House, and John Wiley and Sons, filed suit in district court in New York against the Internet Archive, uh, uh, really for two primary business models that we believe, as outlined in, our, in the complaint, function like, pirate, like a pirate site. Uh, mm -hmm. One is the Open Library and one is the National Emergency Library, which they have now announced that they will shut down, uh, but it, it doesn't change the, the business model, um, the modeling of, of pirate behavior or the damage that was done. Effectively, the Internet Archive invites, you know, they solicit and, and um, collect truckloads of print books, and they convert them to digital formats, really bootleg scans, and then they distribute them, make them available, offer them to the public for download uh, in their entirety without any license of any kind. And in doing that, as the complaint outlines, they affect both the print market and the ability of the author and the publisher to control the manner and the time of how to communicate their works to the public. You know, when will something be offered in a digital business model? When will it be offered in a print model? on what terms. These are all very well-established uh, markets and business channels and business decisions built on the copyright framework and the ability of the author and publisher uh, to make those decisions. And then of course, um, by making it available for free in its entirety to the public, uh, as the, again, as the complaint outlines, the question becomes what provision under copyright law authorizes a downstream actor to step in and do that uh, without, again, any authorization. And, you know, that's not something that e-commerce platforms can do. It's not something that bookstores can do. And it's definitely not something that, that libraries operating lawfully in the legitimate copyright marketplace would do. 
Uh, so, you know, it's, it's quite astonishing. And within the last year, there was a white paper published that seemed to take this to systemic levels uh, and, and almost invite others to adopt these models. And so at the end of the day, there, these are servers providing access to books that are highly valuable, literary properties that authors have researched and written uh, and licensed to publishers and publishers have invested in those. So the lawsuit really uh, makes clear that in the opinion of the plaintiffs and the AAP, the Internet Archive has usurped both the intellectual investments of the authors and the financial investments of the publishers uh, and operates wholly outside of the Copyright Act, we believe, as Congress enacted it. Uh, so yeah, it's, I mean, a, it's it, a big step. It's a big step, but it was necessary. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, and it, it, it sounds really very clearly illegal. I mean, what, what, what's going on? And, and I'm sure it's not that because I've, I've seen some comments from, 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 the, um, uh, from the people behind the Internet Archive saying that the publishers are against libraries, which is, of course, nonsense. I mean, we, we publishers also are, of course, not against uh, libraries, just against uh, uh, illegal, uh, 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 illegal sharing of information. Libraries have always been part of the lawful copyright marketplace since the beginning. They play a really special role in society. Every publisher and author would agree with that. Um, Absolutely. They, you know, they have, uh, authors have challenges during this pandemic. Publishers, as we've talked about, have had a lot of challenges. Bookstores are really struggling uh, to survive. We, uh, we, we at AAP teamed up with the Booksellers Association and the Authors Guild on World Book Day to, to uh, promote independent bookstores because, again, the, the concern there is that they won't be able to open again after such a, a serious shutdown. And, as you described, you know, they've been doing their best to deliver books to people through all kinds of local channels, you know, whether it's uh, uh, couriers or, or in cars or bicycles. So, but, but back to libraries, um, you know, libraries are uh, business partners. They have every right to negotiate with publishers and authors. I, have, I am not aware of any library that has ever decided to throw the Copyright Act completely out the window and decide that because they may not like it, uh, which is the way that the Internet Archives activity feels, that they don't have to follow it. Uh, and, you know, there are two, two things at play. One is uh, an invented theory that if you have a print copy, you can make a digital copy and then distribute it. That's not anywhere in the law. And then there was the national emergency part of it in which a private actor basically declared that it had the authority to give itself emergency powers outside of the Copyright Act. Um, Congresses have always enacted emergency powers, but they do it as a legislative body with public feedback. And at the end of the day, we all have to believe as associations that, uh, that the rule of law is important. That's how our business um, goes forward. It's built on the contours of the law both the rights and the exceptions. And, uh, you know, for us, this, this is something that belonged in court. Yeah, and thank you, Maria, for, for explaining in such a clear way what seems to be a kind of a difficult, a difficult uh, complex problem. And, and I think it was a very clear explanation. Thank you for that. And on another, on another topic, um, I also know that you have been closely connected to IPA's Vice President, Budur mm -hmm. Al-Khazimi, uh, al Hasimi's published her uh, initiative. Uh, do you think that the pandemic has had any effect on issues on, of uh, diversity and inclusion in the U.S. publishing industry? Well, absolutely. Uh, so first, yes, uh, your vice chair uh, at IPA, Badura al Hasimi, is a true global leader. She was instrumental uh, in taking a conversation uh, over lunch that the two of us had. Uh, informed by our conversations with other women and turning it into a real global platform, uh, really where women can meet each other around the world. And uh, we've had such exciting events and dinners and programs already and would have had them again at the international book fairs this year. But mm -hmm. that's exciting and I think Publish Hers is here to stay. And uh, if anything, we have uh, so many women who want to participate and not enough hours in the day 
I think it'll actually lead to business decisions as well, you know, business collaborations around the world. So um, more broadly though, uh, and beyond gender diversity, we in the US are going through um, a very intense time because of racial abuse in the United States that has, and ra that, that stems from racial policies that uh, has had just an extraordinarily horrific impact on our African American community in particular. And that, um, you know, has, has definitely also uh, affected publishing houses. And so this week on Monday, there were employees of US publishing houses who took the day off to protest in solidarity uh, and to demand change even within their own workforces. And C you, we saw CEOs across the US publishing market make statements that they're mm -hmm. listening and that they agree that they have not met the objectives that they publicly stated that they support and uh, are, are going to be working very carefully to put, put platforms in place that actually lead to real change. That there's a component of that that also um, affects the authors. And so, you know, again, the question is, uh, what are we publishing and for what audiences and and are we reaching all audiences and are we giving all all authors a voice and how do we do better uh, for the communities that maybe are not as well represented uh, so uh, yesterday we also met with the congressional hispanic caucus about some of these issues and so these these conversations you know are happening at every level within houses amongst authors at associations with legislators, with the media, it, that's all good. Um, we as an industry need to take a look at, e at ourselves and I know that IPA has been um, really looking at these issues for several years now, all kinds of diversity mm -hmm. issues. Yes. Very important, um, very important. Very, absolutely, very important. And I'm, 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 I'm sorry to hear all the news coming from, from the US, uh, Maria, and, and, and please be assured that the IPA uh, stands with you in solidarity against racism, and um, um, I, I hope, I really hope, I trust that um, even if it's if it's become such a crisis, it will have a positive a positive outcome. That that people are reacting, that people are are really uh, uh, seeing that there is a problem with that and and, and addressing it. So I, I I really hope it will have a positive outcome. Thank you, Hugo. I, I think so. I think, uh, you know, you need to have um, the, the conversations and the protest across mm -hmm. cities and there needs to be a response and then there needs to be a constructive uh, dialogue to, to um, change what didn't work in the past. I'll also say, though, just coming back to our industry, people are also reading about mm -hmm. racism mm -hmm. and anti-racism and injustice and inequality and history. Uh, and that, that's, that's good. And that comes back to what we do and what our mission is. Our mission mm -hmm. is to disseminate knowledge and to inspire and empower people. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Maria. And that uh, takes us nearly uh, to, to, to the end of our interview. But I, I just, uh, I also wanted to, to mention that you, you had uh, very recently just such a great um, online General Assembly and 50th anniversary celebration. Congratulations again. Thank you. Um, what what can you tell us about the importance? I mean, you have you have been talking about that uh, during all the interview, but uh, about the importance of the work of publishers and what do you see for the future for the next fifty years, perhaps? Well, I think I think uh, I'd like to think that it shows that um, you know an industry as important as the publishing industry needs associations representing it, and the advocacy okay. is important. It's important to be at the table. Everyone else. And the value chain is at the table around mm -hmm. policy decisions. I think for AAP, um, it has always been involved in the copyright framework. The copyright framework over the past 50 years, you know, on the one hand is still there. It's very clear. It provides exclusive rights and exceptions and enforcement and we're part of international treaties. And because of that, um, not only the book industry, but uh, the movie industry and the music industry and all of the many, many creative people out there who every day get up and uh, create for a living as a very uh, expert craft can continue to do that, which helps us move forward as a society. And I see the copyright framework as a, a 
very closely aligned with uh, human progress. But for AAP, that will change again, right? It's impossible to know what our, what our uh, world will look like in 50 years. Uh, but it's exciting, and I think a lot of people really enjoyed it. We had a tribute video uh, of which you were part, Hugo. Thank you for your, your participation on that. We had policymakers from um, the U.S. Congress. We had the Director General of, of WIPO. Uh, we had lots of industry leaders, both large and small companies. And I, I think people, you know, coming together around their association is as important as going to work and thinking about their own business every day. As you said, we're all part of an inter interconnected community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I, 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 th I thought it was a great video. And, and, and thank mm -hmm. you for, for those words. I, I, I think it's really, really encouraging to, to, to see uh, that uh, such an important work we do as publishers, as you have been addressing throughout uh, all the, the interview. Um, so, well, it, um, thank you, Maria. Thank you so much. Uh, it has been such a, a pleasure to have this conversation with you. It's my pleasure, Hugo. And I just want to, on behalf of everybody at the AAP, give a huge hello to all of our colleagues at all of the publisher associations around the world uh, brought together by IPA. And thank you for your work again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Bye. Bye.